What happens when children get in the way of love? A look at the case of Diane Downs shows the dark things that can happen in such a situation. Diane Downs appeared to enjoy a lovely life for many years. She had three children, Christy Ann, Cheryl Lynn, and Stephen Daniel, and was married to her high school sweetheart. What more could she ask for? That ideal picture, however, was destroyed when Diane took a turn to the dark side. Stephen Downs, her husband, divorced her in 1980 when he grew convinced that young Danny was not his son. She sought temporary relief with a new partner who eventually left her because of her children. Downs took action and did the unthinkable so that she could be with him. Welcome to Twisted Minds. My name is James and today we will look at the heartbreaking case of a mother who committed one of the most disgusting crimes a parent could imagine. May 19th, 1983 remained as hot a night as it had been at midday. Even though the sun had long set over the beautiful hills of Springfield, Oregon, the evening was calm, the lingering stillness that occasionally precedes a storm. The night staff at McKenzie Willamette Hospital frequently found themselves with an intuitive ability to sense something terrible in the air. And as experts, they were always prepared. Nothing could have prepared them for the drama that erupted at their literal doorstep at 10.48 p.m. There had been no warning until the red, late model Nissan with Arizona license plates staggered into the emergency drop-off, bleeding its horn as if to scare the devils from hell. The night crew all heard it, and their expressions told them right away that what they had expected, a calm night in the ER, was not to be. Dr. John Mackey, the attending physician, and two nurses, Rose Martin, and Shelby Day felt the usual adrenaline rush. A blonde woman in her 20s waved them on in the driveway, just beyond the ER's double automatic doors. She appeared pale in the fluorescent tube lighting, and she wildly gestured to the interior of her car. Someone just shot my babies, was all she could say. Patterson called the cops. Nurses Martin and Day shook as they glanced through the Nissan's windows. The side panels were soaked in blood, and three young children were in the car. One in the front passenger seat, and two in the rear. The nurses could tell immediately that the children had been shot at close range. The nurses guessed the golden-haired child up front, a girl, couldn't have been more than seven or eight years old. Of the two in the back, one was a girl and the other was a boy, barely a toddler. Two of the children were still breathing, though fitfully. The kids slumped in the front seat appeared to be beyond help. Despite the surgeon's frantic attempts on the operating table, the injury had been fatal. She died shortly after being brought to the emergency room. Only afterward did the medics learn the children's names and ages. Christy Downs, eight. Cheryl Ann Downs, seven, and Danny Downs, three. But names and ages didn't matter at the time. What mattered was that someone without a heart had intentionally attempted to murder three children in cold blood. Despite the children's critical state, Mackey and his team kept them alive miraculously. Soon, the question started to float around. Who in God's name could have pointed a gun at three small kids and pulled the trigger? <laughs> Diane, their mother, did not answer. She told hospital receptionist Patterson that she and her family were going home from a friend's house in neighboring Marcola when a man, a bushy-haired stranger, waved them over on a lonely stretch of highway. Diane stopped to speak, thinking he needed assistance. And that's when, according to a sobbing Diane, the man aimed his handgun through her car window and loosened the barrel on her three terrified children. Springfield and Lane County Police Departments both responded. She repeated the ambush story and gave them an odd description of the wanderer. In response to the report, the agencies issued an emergency alert on municipal and county highways, believing that a lunatic was roaming Springfield suburbs, lanes, and byways. Squads were called in and the area Diane identified as the point of assault near McCola and Old Mohawk Road became a focal point of the manhunt. Because the incident was allegedly committed in the county, the Lane County Sheriff's Office officers were assigned as primary investigators. Sergeant Robin Rutherford was the first officer from the county to approach the children's mother at the hospital. When he arrived, the nurses treated her arm, which had a series of minor, superficial wounds between the elbow and the wrist from trying to fend off the gunman's strikes. Mrs. Down's injuries were minimal, and she appeared to be extraordinarily tranquil. She seemed to be in full control of her senses, so he urged her to follow him to the exact location as best as she could in the dark. The location she remembered, near the intersection of two rural roads, was hardly where a young woman with three children should have stopped her car to speak to a stranger. When Diane returned to the hospital, she was informed that her middle child, Cheryl, 
had died. She absorbed the news with elegance, but her demeanor astounded the hospital staff, who had imagined her bursting into tears. Diane appeared too receptive. When told that Danny had a chance of survival, she answered, almost puzzled. Do you mean the bullet didn't hit his heart? Oh my goodness. Detectives who interviewed her in a private room at Mackenzie Willamette Hospital were astounded by her demeanor. A sharp-witted veteran of the county's homicide squad named Dick Tracy, a detective, found her to be unlike previous ladies he had met following similar emergencies. He later described her as quite sensible, given what she had been through. Tracy interviewed her with his partner on the case, Detective Doug Welch, who also thought Diane Downs was too stoic for a mother whose entire brood had just been shot. They gained some personal background on the mother and her children and began building a chronology of events leading up to the shooting. They had discovered that the bullets fired at the children were from a 22 caliber fired from either a handgun or a rifle. Police suspected a handgun. Powder burns on the children's flesh suggested that the weapon was shot at close range, particularly those on the deceased girl, Cheryl who was in the front seat. The blood splattered across the car's doors, seats, windows, and other surfaces suggested that the murderer had fired the gun from the left or driver's side, which confirmed Diane's account that the attacker had attacked through her window. The detectives discovered that the mother was 27 years old, a postal worker for the United States Postal Service. She had worked as a letter carrier in Chandler, Arizona, but recently divorced a man named Steve Downs. She came to Oregon to be closer to her parents, Willa, and Wes Fredrickson. The Fredricksons were former Arizona residents who had relocated to Oregon years before. Wes Fredrickson worked at the postal office as well. Diane outlined the events of that evening for her interviewers. She and her children had a quick dinner before leaving their little duplex at 1352 Q Street in Springfield for a co-worker's home on a rustic Sunderman Road. Heather Plord, the friend, had told Diane at work a few days earlier that she was thinking about buying a horse. Diane had discovered an advertisement in the newspaper regarding horse rentals that she thought Heather might be interested in seeing. Diane chose to bring the advert personally because she didn't know Heather's phone number and they weren't close friends. She added that the drive provided a nice opportunity to get the kids out of the stuffy house for a couple of hours. Diane decided to take Old Mohawk Road to the main highway on her way home after a brief conversation with Heather and her husband. She felt it would be interesting to go sightseeing and the kids liked seeing the moon in the dark countryside. It was only after turning into Old Mohawk that she noticed the man. She slowed down and got out of her car. The stranger then pulled a pistol from his jacket pocket and demanded that she hand over the keys of her car. She refused, but in retribution, he reached through the driver's window and opened fire on her family, according to Diane. When he reached for the keys, she fought back, but she retreated into her car and he fired again, this time at her injuring her arm. Her Nissan sped away as she slammed the gas pedal. Her children were in pain, and she had just one thought, get them to the hospital as soon as possible. Tracy's thoughts had wandered for a second as Diane spoke. He'd read the doctor's report on Diane's arm injury, which stated that a single bullet entered her forearm. It split in two as it shattered the radius and then exited, leaving two minor wounds. As she described how the bullet injured her arm, he couldn't help but notice that the spot where she was wounded is the same one where other killers had shot themselves when they claimed to have been attacked by a fake assailant. Diane agreed to sign a search warrant for her home before the session ended. She admitted to having a 38 caliber handgun for protection on her delivery route and a 22 caliber rifle for home security, but both were inactive. One was cold and concealed beneath rags in her trunk, while the other gathered dust on a shelf in her home. Meanwhile, police officers were stationed surrounding the facility. They were preparing the red Nissan Pulsar with Arizona license plates for transportation to the crime lab for additional investigation. All employees assigned to this homicide understood without a doubt that the weekend ahead would be filled with little free time and a lot of pounding on doors, questions, and so on. The cops didn't mind the overtime. Three vulnerable infants had their bodies blown open by a gunman. They needed to find the killer immediately. When Diane Downs was finally permitted inside the intensive care unit to meet Christy, one of her two surviving children, many nurses and an investigator were by her bedside. Observers remarked that while she held her daughter's hand muttering, I love you, she did it as cold as an icicle, her words coming through clamped teeth. The investigator, Paul Alton, noticed something else. When she saw her mother arriving, the child's eyes, peering from behind an oxygen mask, took on a fearful face. 
Doubts were growing about the mother's story. Her story of what happened that night altered slightly throughout the next few days. In numerous retellings, her positioning of the killer when he fired the pistol changed, as did her actions in the face of the alleged gunman. When Doug Welch interviewed Diane's ex-husband, Steve Downs in Arizona, he discovered that Diane owned three guns. Not two, one of which was a 22 caliber handgun, which Diane did not mention. Diane denied owning the 22 caliber when questioned afterward. No one in the DA's office, particularly Fred Hoogie, believed that an aggressor had been present on Old Mohawk Road. Wrongdoers have used fictional abductors and thugs as alibis to mask their crimes from the dawn of time. In law enforcement terminology, these fictitious violators are labeled as bushy-haired strangers. A search of the whole crime scene had turned up nothing, but ejected casings from 22 caliber bullets were nearby. Divers even went into the Mohawk River, which passes through the train, but they couldn't discover the rifle. Hoagie went looking himself for the gun, figuring the courts wouldn't have much of a case against Diane Downs without the murder weapon. He waded through the river, but found nothing. To make matters worse, he learned that Christy Downs had suffered a stroke, a direct result of the gunshot wound. Her speech was slurred, and the doctors told him she might never speak again. The left half of the brain, which controls the ability to speak, had been damaged. But there was a glimmer of optimism. Doctors hoped that because she was so young, therapy would be able to reverse the damage and recover her slurring tongue. However, there was no gun to convict Diane, and possibly the murderer's own daughter, the only living witness to the crime, would be unable to convict her mother. On the other hand, Hoogie believed that Diane was guilty more than ever after seeing the diaries and letters taken from her home. They reeked of longing for one Arizona man, her long lost love, a man who, according to the tones of the pages, had abandoned her. His desertion could have been caused by his wife getting involved, as implied by the journal. He sent two investigators to Chandler, Arizona before the weekend was over to find out who this man of her fantasies was. Doug Welch and Paul Alton were sent to Arizona to use their professional knowledge to dig up Diane Downs' history, including her old lover. Diane's ex-lover worked at a post office, and the investigators interrogated him separately at his residence. He insisted on having his wife by his side while he openly described his sexual encounters with his former colleague. He claimed that his wife was aware of his past and had forgiven him. The couple had reconciled, and he no longer had anything to do with Diane Downs. One more thing, the cops inquired if he knew anything about the guns Diane might have. He did. He claimed one of them was a 22 caliber handgun. Diane, on the other hand, continued to deny ownership. Christie's ability to talk was hindered by a stroke, but soon she was able to begin telling investigators what she recalled about that night. Her story had nothing to do with meeting a shaggy-haired man. Because of this, Downs was arrested in February 1984, and her trial began in May of the same year. After all of the evidence against Downs had been presented, a star witness was called to the stand. Christy Downs was able to take the stand and tell the jury who shot her after months of physical and mental therapy. Downs, however, had a strategy for gaining sympathy from the jury. During her trial, she seduced a man on her mail route and became pregnant. Downs was convicted and sentenced to life in prison plus 50 years. She gave birth between the verdict and the punishment. Amy Elizabeth, the baby, was adopted by another family and renamed Becky Babcock. Downs escaped from the Oregon jail where she was imprisoned only three years into her sentence. She was discovered two weeks later mere blocks from the prison, in the house of another inmate's husband. She is still in prison now, with a higher security institution in California. She was rejected for parole in 2008 and 2010, and she must wait a decade before applying again. Diane's ex-lover and his wife are still married. Steve Downs is still a resident of Oregon. Christy and Danny, the youngsters, survived the ordeal. Danny is in a wheelchair, yet he is a happy man. Christy has matured into a contented woman. Both believe their stories will end happily ever after. They moved into the house of their new, loving, adoptive parents, Fred and Joanne Hoogie, in 1986. Thanks for tuning into Twisted Minds. That was the case of Diane Downs, and why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.